All right, um, we can go ahead and get going. Um, welcome to Genome Rounds, everybody. Um, I have a few announcements to start off with. Uh, most of you hopefully know that the um, proposals for UGP pilot funding is due April 5th. Um, so that's in two weeks or so. Um, looking forward to um, uh, getting some new engaged investigators and um, it's always kind of exciting. Uh, April 8th, we uh, will have a precision medicine webinar and it's featuring Dr. Larry Brody, who's going to speak on the National Human Genome Research Institute roadmap, um, followed by a local panel discussion. So we have a few investigators that are hoping to talk a, a little bit, introduce how, how Utah fits into that roadmap. Um, and partially because of this, we're going to skip genome rounds in April. And so our next genome rounds will be May 21st, uh, Friday. And we will hear from the two T32 postdoctoral fellows about their work, um, Kevin Hope and Craig Rush. And then the last genome rounds of the fiscal year will be June 18th. And Marcus Pesalesi will be talking about his very successful diabetes research program. So looking forward to that. Um, and we usually take July off because people are, are out and about. Um, camping, if not traveling these days. <laughs> um, so um, that's it for the announcements. Uh, and I would like to welcome Dr. Hilary Kuhn, um, who is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, Dr. Kuhn is an international leader in understanding genetics of autism, suicide, and many other psychiatric conditions. She is a wonderful collaborator with many colleagues internationally and locally. Many of us have had the benefit of working with Dr. Kuhn. She's just terrific. Um, she is also incredibly knowledgeable on statistical methods to interrogate phenotypes and genetics, bringing them together as well as using Utah Population Database as a resource and has many years under her belt um, of navigating uh, these, these um, really important resources. Um, I am pleased to share with everybody that this year she was named the H.A. and Edna Benning Presidential Endowed Chair, which is a well-deserved recognition of her work to further medical knowledge. Um, and without further ado, I welcome Dr. Kuhn, who's going to talk about her research on suicide. Welcome. Thanks very much, Deb. That was a very nice introduction. And I just want to make sure that I made it clear here on the um, on the title slide that this is not just my work, it's the work of a large and growing number of collaborators that are interested in studying risk factors for suicide. And we're <clears throat> becoming, I think, somewhat of a uh, local, regional, and national uh, powerhouse for uh, this type of research. Uh, let's see, sorry. Uh-oh, no, I'm not going to the next slide. There we go. Um, one thing I just wanted to make sure, I am going to be talking about suicide risk today. And if you find this at all uh, triggering or if it makes you uncomfortable, I just wanted to make sure I put some prevention resources here. These are also helpful for, if you know of anybody who's in crisis, lots of uh, regional, local, national uh, resources. And I'm gonna have this also at the end of the talk. So um, there are also a lot of good web sources for research statistics about suicide. If, you're, if you become more interested in it, um, these are some places you can go to find out some of the national and international research. So um, I got interested in thinking about suicide risk factors, um, partly because I, I think this is a, a very high impact area regarding public health. Certainly suicide is a really big public health crisis right now. Uh, most recent statistics from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention show uh, over 48,000 deaths in the US per year due to suicide. And you know, it's worth remembering that these are potentially preventable deaths. It's also the case that suicide death has increased dramatically in the US uh, since the late 90s. And this increase is even more so actually in Utah, up about 46% since the late 90s. And 
And it's worth thinking about the fact that we have made really great strides in psychiatry and treatment of mental illness. And it's, it's interesting to note that this hasn't actually transferred into uh, a decrease in the, in the suicide death rates. In fact, they've actually gone up. And why is this the case? So one, the, I, I just want you to kind of keep that, that little fact in mind as we go through the next few slides. We do know that suicide is incredibly complicated. Um, definitely a lot of factors go into risk for suicide. And genetics certainly one of them. And this is something that our group is really focused on here for a variety of reasons. We have lots of good resource to look at this. We do know also that mental illness is associated with suicide risk, but it's worth remembering that over 90% of people with a psychiatric diagnosis don't die by suicide. And a recent CDC study showed that uh, over 50% of suicide deaths had no psychiatric diagnosis or at least no evident psychiatric diagnosis. Now this is, it's possible that this is poor access to treatment, um, but it's also worth thinking about the idea that suicide risk could ind indeed be its own risk factor, somewhat uncoupled from risk of mental illness. Some of this work that's actually now um, 35 years old uh, suggests that this may be the case. So this is work done by Janice Eglin. This is really seminal work in psychiatry. She studied uh, individuals in the old order Amish community. And um, the focus of her studies was really on individuals with depression and bipolar disorder. And she studied this in a, in a familial context. So she studied many families uh, where aggregation of these disorders was apparent. And she noticed that of all of these families that she studied, the suicides actually aggregated in only four of them. So they seem to be very um, sort of concentrated in only a few of these families that were, that had high risk of affective disorders. So even then, 35 years ago, she suggested that the familial risk of suicide may be really independent of psychopathology. Now you could argue in a family that's as close as this, that some of the risks in this family might be due to shared family environment. And that's certainly the case. Um, and in Utah, of course, because of the rich genealogical data that we have, we can actually even look at this issue. Uh, this work was done by my colleague, Amanda Bakian, and it shows that yes, indeed, there is a very significant increase in familial risk for close relatives, first and second degree. Once you get out to um, more distantly related individuals, you actually still see a significantly increased risk of suicide death, uh, suggesting that this is now becoming more and more uncoupled from the shared familial environment and suggests some uh, genetic etiology. There are other ways of thinking about uh, whether or not suicide risk might have a genetic component. Um, and, and there are several decades of uh, research in, along these lines. Um, lots of twin studies have been done. Uh, an aggregated uh, meta-analysis of these twin studies has shown that fraternal twins, which are um, essentially, they're gonna share about half their genome on average. These are like full siblings. Uh, they're, they're going to be about four times the population rate. Whereas identical twins who share are sharing all of their uh, genome are about 11 times the population rate. So this, this is suggesting uh, very strongly a genetic etiology. There also are some adoption studies, uh, starting with a suicide death and then looking at the adopting relatives where <clears throat> they, there is uh, essentially no increased risk. So the adopting relatives would share familial uh, environmental risk factors and um, those do not appear to be really elevating risk to any degree. However, if you look at the biological relatives, you see four to five times the population rate um, risk among the, the biological relatives. So if you take all of this evidence together, it appears that the genetic contribution to risk of suicide death is around 50%. So this suggests that um, looking for genetic risk factors for this complex phenotype 
could, uh, could prove fruitful. So why Utah? Well, I did show on the second slide there, or third slide, that uh, it looks like suicide risk increased dramatically in Utah. Right now, we have the dubious distinction of being sixth in the nation for a suicide rate. In Utah, suicide is the leading cause of death for individuals under the age of 25. So it looks as though it's a, it's a significant problem here in particular. The other issue is, is that we have several really unique resources that make these studies possible here. One of them is a really strong collaboration that we have with our medical examiner. It's also the case that in Utah, there is a centralized office of the medical examiner, which makes the logistics of this collaboration much more possible. Um, right now, due to the foresight of my colleague, Doug Gray, who started this collaboration with the medical examiner a couple of decades ago, we have a collection of now close to 8,000 individuals who died by suicide where we have DNA samples. So this is a fantastic uh, resource and is really not matched anywhere worldwide uh, for suicide death. We also have uh, linked these um, suicide deaths to the Utah population database. We have a, a way to do that that allows us to study the data that is linked to the Utah population database with these individuals in a de-identified way um, where the linking is done within the UPDB. And through this linking, we have access to a couple of decades of medical records data. We have um, this for the U uh, University of Utah medical health system and also for the Intermountain health system. Um, we, we can look at demographic data. Importantly, we can look at the geneal genealogical records that again are a very unique resource um, that we have here at the University of Utah for doing medical research. We also have some uh, access to exposure data that is now encoded within the UPDB. So really all of the combination of these, um, these sample resources and data resources give us a really unique uh, way to study suicide death here in Utah. So it, it, we feel it's very important actually to study suicide death. Um, a lot of the studies that are, uh, it's sort of a growth industry right now in uh, studying genetics of suicide, but a lot of these studies worldwide are looking at the risk of suicide attempt. And of course it's important to study suicide attempt. That's an important phenotype, but it's, we feel that it's very, um, very much uh, important also to study the endpoint of suicide death. So, Part of the reason for this is that uh, one of the best predictors at this point for suicide death is a prior attempt of suicide. However, fewer than 7% of people who attempt suicide actually go on to die by suicide. And again, sort of similar to the psychiatric um, diagnosis data, uh, recent studies have shown that over 50% of suicide deaths actually occur with no prior attempt. So this, this predictor, uh, which is prior suicide attempt actually doesn't do a great job of predicting. And we really feel that if we um, use some of our unique data resources, we'll be able to understand risks of suicide death better. And then if we can do this, then we will be able to, uh, be, uh, to help in the development of more personalized treatments for those who are most at risk of dying by suicide. So we have now started to um, assemble a really good collaborative group of individuals who are, are thinking about how to get at risk for suicide death. We have a lot of tools that we use and uh, different folks in our collaborative team are experts in different areas of thinking about risk. We've started really creating partnerships across the, across the University of Utah departments, but also with the Utah Department of Health with Intermountain and with folks um, who are interested in suicide prevention at the level of the state of Utah. And we're using a lot of these different types of ways of looking for suicide risk. We're very interested in um, uncovering genetic risks uh, and, and also identifying risk subgroups. We're hoping that this will then lead us to the next step, which is discovering truly biological mechanisms 
and also figuring out the environmental interactions. So figuring out how those individuals who have specific biological uh, vulnerabilities are um, then made more vulnerable to certain types of exposures. We also have a team in our group that's thinking very hard about ethical, legal, and social impacts of the work that we're doing. And we have ongoing uh, work uh, in this area to sort of reach out also to the people who are going to be the consumers of our research and figure out what their attitudes are towards this and um, how it may impact them. So that's kind of an overview of what we're doing. Um, and what I really wanted to do today was to give you an update of just one small aspect of the work that we're engaged in. Uh, this is looking at whole genome sequence data in a subset of our large cohort. Uh, this is, of course, looking at uh, rare variant, more rare variant risk discovery. This is complementary to genome-wide association studies, which are in the, the discovery of more common variants. And I'm hoping all of you, or at least some of you, saw the VITA event that my co colleague Anna Doherty did um, a couple months ago on her work. Um, that's really been uh, very groundbreaking in, in uh, some of the, the largest genome-wide association study results on suicide death that is now out uh, and published. So we also have been um, engaged in looking at familially, specifically familially transmitted variants using shared genomic segments in uh, collaboration with Nikki Camp's group. And some of the whole genome data that we will be playing around with it over the next several months, of course, could potentially interact with results that we got from the shared segments and also could interact with results uh, and implicated genes from our GWAS. So what we wanted to do with our whole genome sorry. project, sorry. sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt, Hillary. I am seeing um, the, the whole genome sequencing slide, and I think that the slides are not progressing now in the presentation, possibly. Oh, um, I'm, I'm still just sitting there on the whole genome slide. Oh, just oh, slow. No. Okay, okay, <laughs> sorry. I, I'll talk for another 10 minutes about the whole genome slide. No, I'm just kidding. No, no worries. I, I think we're good. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for the alert, though. Um, okay, so I, I just want to talk about the strategy that we had at this point. So we, we need to, you know, we have a huge cohort of people with DNA. So who do we pick to, uh, to do whole genome sequencing on? Well, our original design was looking at shared segments. So we were looking at people in, in uh, high-risk families. And we wanted to sort of expand this and uh, include a few more individuals. So in our next wave of uh, whole genome sequencing, which we actually accomplished last fall, we used kind of a slightly different uh, way of prioritizing um, suicides for the, our sequencing. Uh, we still used the um, extended uh, high-risk families, but in a slightly different way. And we really appreciate the uh, capacity to be able to process these data using the Utah Center for Genomic Discovery, which has been doing, uh, or it has completed joint calling with our previous whole genome data and also Utah controls. Um, so we've, we've completed, and what I wanna to talk to you about today is some genome-wide analyses that are really what I would call low-hanging fruit. Um, we're proceeding with some more complex analyses uh, as, I, as I speak. And also then sort of talk a little bit about how we use the whole genome data to think about um, targeted follow-up of some previous array-based um, analyses. And there it goes, yay. So now you can finally see a new slide. <laughs> Uh, so the way that we wanted to do this prioritization was using the Utah high-risk families. Now, we know that we've used this before as an analysis tool with our shared segments, uh, familial transmitted variance analysis. But we also kind of think of this as um, delineating a risk subgroup. So we know that the, the cases, the suicide deaths who link to these high-risk families share minimal familial environments. And I've shown you a couple of uh, the high-risk families that we have ascertained. Um, and we, we, we know that the reason that these 
families are high risk is really due to genetics and not shared familial environment because the, the cases are so distantly related to one another. So one of the things that we thought was, okay, these suicides in our minds look like they probably are enriched for um, genetic risk. And we wanted to look at comparing those suicides that link to high-risk families to, to Utah, Utah suicides that don't link to high-risk families. So we, we took um, about 3,600 of our Utah suicide deaths that had genotyping, but also had electronic health records data. And we linked these to the genealogical records. And the, this gives us a lot of families. So we have over 900 high-risk families in this linkage. Uh, this does include suicide, known suicides back to 1904 in the, in the database. Um, so the, the definition of those families includes suicides that don't that we haven't yet, that we don't have data on, but um, this represents uh, about 2%, we think, of families of about this size. So we, we looked at a five to one match control um, set of Utah individuals to sort of get an estimate of how many families we would, we would pull out of about the size of our high-risk families. So, so this is about 2% of families of that size, and we see a overnight, 90% of our suicides linked to high-risk families. So the suicide death in the Utah data is very familial. So it's worth stating that up front. We have a lot of individuals who link to high-risk families. So this is, this is um, of the people who link to the genealogies, uh, overall over 90% linked to high-risk families. So what we did was we tried to compare those people who link to these families as being sort of proxy for genetic risk to those who don't link very well at all to the genealogical database. Those are just unknown. And then a small number of people who, yes, they link to the, the genealogies, but they don't link to any high risk families. So it's kind of a small number, but it gives us a good comparison. So what we see is no difference in sex uh, ratio, but we see that those individuals who link to the high-risk families are um, die by suicide at a younger age than overall. Those who link to the genealogies, but they're not linked to a high-risk family, actually die at a much older uh, age, which, which is interesting. So um, the bottom line there is European ancestry, and what this shows us is that if you link to the genealogies, you tend to be more white. And that's maybe not unexpected because the genealogical records are um, from the uh, donated to the university for, by the LDS Church for uh, for research purposes, and they tend to be more en enriched for European ancestry. Oops. So if we look at our um, our clinical data, so this is from electronic health records data we see that there is an increase in suicide attempts in those individuals who link to high-risk families. And there's also an uh, increase in exposure to um, accidental trauma and uh, a diagnosis of PTSD in among those cases. Uh, if you're linked to the genealogies and you actually, but you don't link to a high-risk family, you're actually lower for diagnoses of depression and anxiety. And we were so interested in that result, we actually compared to the non-suicide five to one age and sex match Utah controls for diagnosis. And when we do that, the high risk familial or suicide are higher for all the, the psychiatric diagnoses. Um, in the table that you're looking at, right, this is a within suicide comparison. So we're comparing high familial risk suicides to low familial risk suicides to unknown familial risk suicides. And that's where we see this, this sort of specific pattern of really uh, more suicide attempts, more accidental trauma in the high familial risk suicides, less depression, less anxiety in the low familial risk suicides. So when we compare that to the, the um, age sex match controls, Everything's elevated in high familial risk suicides. The low familial risk suicides are higher only for suicide attempts, 
not for any other psychiatric diagnoses. So then we wanted to look at polygenic risks in these groups. Uh, a polygenic risk score of just kind of giving you a little schematic of what that is. Um, what, what we do is we take external statistics from um, published GWAS of the traits that we're interested in. We take their, the results from those GWAS, which are essentially effect sizes across the genome for that trait of interest. And we can then uh, take all of those effect sizes across the genome and create an aggregated statistic for each of our Utah suicides for the trait of interest. And <clears throat> when we've done this, we've also looked only within the very much uh, European ancestry cases, just because of sensitivity of polygenic risk scores to ancestry effects. We've also just for age and sex and any residual ancestry effects. So trying to be very careful with that. When we did this, um, we also wanted to, so we picked out um, polygenic risk scores that matched our clinical data. So in the psychiatric realm, this included suicide attempts, depression, anxiety, PTSD, bipolar disorder, substance use, et cetera. We looked also at some medical conditions um, that might've been of interest, obesity, cardiovascular disease, um, also sleep disorders. We really wanted to look at specific polygenic risk of suicide death. And there honestly isn't another um, big genome-wide association study that we could use as discovery. <laughs> for looking at uh, risk of suicide death. So we, we used actually our own uh, GWAS and um, did made, used a tenfold uh, cross-validation procedure in order to create a polygenic risk score using our own data. So essentially you divide the sample into 10 folds. For each of the folds, we perform a GWAS on the remaining nine folds that we create a suicide death polygenic risk score. And what this does is for every sample, it's suicide death polygenic risk score is then based on a GWAS that doesn't include that sample. So this is a way to, to get at this really important phenotype for us in thinking about whether or not these cases are really enriched for uh, specific genetic risk. And you can see that that indeed is the case. So the suicides, again, this is a comparison within the, our suicide deaths. Um, and those that look high familial risk are very much increased for um, uh, polygenic risk of suicide, attempt, suicide death, um, also suicide attempt, also interestingly PTSD and risk-taking behavior. Um, and that might, if you can remember the um, electronic health records slide, that might match with what we saw there for uh, an increase in exposure to accidental trauma and, the, and PTSD. The low risk cases, even though it's a small group, are very significantly decreased for polygenic risk of depression. So again, kind of an unusual group. So in summary, and I know that took just a little while, but we wanted to be really careful about who we pick for um, whole genome sequencing. And it does indeed appear that cases that link to uh, high risk families in the genealogical records are actually at great, greater uh, genetic risk of suicide. And this is fairly specific actually to suicide death and suicide attempt with then this other element that looks like it's associated with trauma, uh, and maybe PTSD, also risk-taking. So this was an interesting result for us because I actually thought we were going to see elevated risk for all kinds of psychiatric uh, disorders, but maybe it makes sense in, in terms of the sort of historical context of thinking about potential independence of suicide risk from psychiatric disorder risk. So. We picked out a new set of whole genome uh, suicide deaths, and we now have a whole, a whole genome uh, resource that is 670 um, high, we think high familial risk suicides. And we have looked at, um, again, this is a really preliminary result, um, but we looked at a subset of about 62,000 variants 
These are cherry picked from the genome sequence uh, to be in coding regions or in or near coding regions and likely to impact gene function. Uh, and of these, um, we, we see what's in the table in front of you. So these are ones where we have looked at the variants in uh, NOMAD and um, sort of filtered them for not having uh, any kind of flags uh, regarding quality of the variant. We actually filtered, prior to that, we actually filtered our own sequence for quality. So this is looking at high quality sequence uh, in our cases in the Utah controls, um, filtering then also on a p-value that is uh, that takes into account that we we're looking at a, a set of 62,000 uh, variants. So genome-wide significance at this at this point is about eight times ten to the minus seven. So um, you'll see a number of genes here. So these are are um, much more increase in frequency in our cases than in the Utah controls and also against the NOMAD frequency. Uh, so this is the, the database of um, whole genome, uh, the version three of NOMAD. And they, for the most part, have high impacts. This is the CAD score, uh, reflects the annotation for the gene as having high impact. There are a few of them here that we pulled out using SLIVR, which is one of the UCGG's tools as potentially being a, a variant of high impact. And they may not be, um, you can see them there, they're highlighted in gray or low lighted in gray. <laughs> and these may be ones where we'll wanna look more carefully and see whether or not they actually uh, have anything, any kind of regulatory impact, but they look like they're, they're less uh, high impact from Nomad. So what are these genes? Um, it's of interest to me that several of them already have pretty interesting functional uh, interest in the, in the previous literature. So two of them here that I underlined are ones where we actually saw already multiple variants within these genes. This first one, AK2, is a mitochondrial protein, and it's been highlighted in another published study as a possible suicide biomarker. It's also uh, altered in postmortem brain tissue in individuals with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And then there are a number of other um, genes here that are either involved in some way in uh, neuronal um, functioning and brain development. Uh, this one, PAB, PABPC1, is uh, involved in neurodegeneration. It's also associated with risk-taking behavior, which um, is from a, a published study in the, um, uh, let's see, I think it's in the UK Biobank. Uh, folate is actually, was actually previously implicated in one of our shared genomic segment studies as being a potential uh, variant that, or a potential gene that might have a variance that were familiarly transmitted in some high-risk families. And this gene is interesting in that it, it modulates excitatory neurotransmission transmission, and it's been implicated in schizophrenia. So we're already interested in many of these genes. There, of course, are some that I didn't put on this slide because I don't know what the heck they do. And we'll see whether or not we've found some other things that are novel in this ongoing effort. So at this point, we're engaged in a more um, complex statistical uh, burden analyses. We're looking in this context, a burden analysis will take into account effects of multiple variants in, within genes. Um, we can then engage in some gene pathway tests. Uh, we're planning on integrating regulatory annotations and also in integrating some genome-wide expression data. So all of these efforts are ongoing now in this um, new rich data set. Once we're sort of happy with our top uh, variants that we've found, we're, we're going to proceed with some manual validation. We're of course going to be looking at who are the people that are carrying any variants of interest? So this would be looking at clinical um, co-occurring conditions. We're looking at demographics um, and then hoping uh, 
that all of this is going to lead us to potential risk subgroups. Uh, replication is interesting. So, I mean, you can see by when we were trying to use cross validation for uh, our polygenic risk of suicide death, we're a little bit challenged as far as replication. And this is because, again, there just really aren't other worldwide cohorts that where there are a lot of uh, cases of suicide death. Um, we're hoping that a few more of these will come online. There's some in, um, folks in Finland. There's also a Swedish cohort uh, that have at least several thousand uh, cases of suicide death. And we're hoping that these may be ways that we can do some replication. We also, of course, keep collecting data. Um, and the suicide data cohort um, actually grows by, at this point, between uh, six and 700, probably over 700 at this point every year. So even within another few years, um, we have the capacity to independently replicate ourselves with new Utah data. So I, I think it's worth mentioning, I mean, it's exciting to have these data and to, to really look at uh, some new genome-wide discovery. We're also really excited to use the genome data to follow up um, a lot of other published and unpublished studies that we've been engaging in over the years. So certainly following up our shared segments analyses, we have oh, probably 200 candidate genes, target genes that were um, identified by uh, shared genomic segments, regions that were highly significant in families. We also have um, array-based studies that have been done. Uh, I mentioned before our GWAS, and this has implicated 22 genes. It's implica implicated several gene pathways. There are associations that are known from that GWAS with postmortem expression data. Uh, we also have a genome-wide study of rare array SNPs done by my colleague Emily de Blasi, and this indicated um, five genes um, with validated functional SNPs, uh, validated in sequence data, and um, this is actually really promising as well, and this, this is uh, an impress um, publication, so we'll be following that up as well. And then we're also engaging in international consortium studies. And these are uh, also indicating uh, positional candidates through genome-wide association. And uh, some of these are really truly large studies. And I'll just give you a little taste of that in a minute. So just to go back to our Utah uh, genome-wide association study and give you a little bit more detail on this, um, this was about 3,400 Utah suicides, a bunch of matched ancestry match controls. Uh, again, 22 genes implicated. A lot of interesting polygenic risk associations. One of them I just underlined here because it just matches with a lot of the stuff that we've been coming up um, with over and over in different sort of ways of looking at our data, which is um, this association with disinhibition. So that's a, a phenotype that's, that's very similar to the risk-taking uh, association that we saw with their high, high risk, um, high familial risk suicide deaths. So I've listed some of the, uh, the, the implicated genes here. The ones that are highlighted in red are the ones that overlap with some psychiatric expression data. So this is a very large study of postmortem brain tissue expression in either schizophrenia, autism, and or bipolar disorder. So several of our, the genes implicated in our GWAS have those kinds of associations. You also noticed maybe that I highlighted FOXP2, and that's because it's going to come up in a minute. Um, stay tuned. So several implicated pathways as well. One of them is neuronal development. Another one that I just want to highlight here is mitochondrial pathways. So this is something that we weren't really expecting but the, the um, combined risk between mitochondrial dysfunction and psychiatric disorders has been sort of a recent, uh, a recent finding, not just in our studies, but in several different uh, research groups. 
So how are we how are we following this up? Well, we can look right away for uh, variants of medium to high impact in genes implicated by these uh, this study. Also, in we can look at structural variants overlapping with coding regions. We haven't really explored the structural variants in our data set yet, but we're excited to do that and excited to use the UCG, UCGD's tools that are really visual for um, looking at SVs. I, we can also do targeted burden analysis, um, looking at these pr particular implicated genes and also expanding out to gene pathways. And certainly we can um, incorporate other annotations and expression data. So the, this is uh, looking at some of the, the top findings from the International Suicide Genetic Consortium. And our group is now part of this big consortium. Um, there is a genome-wide association study, a new one. Uh, the lead author on this is Neve Mullins, who's a close collaborator of ours. She's at uh, Mount Sinai. This study is impressive. Close to 30,000 individuals with suicidal behavior compared to over 500,000 controls. This is in 21 worldwide cohorts. The top locus that was found in this particular GWAS is on chromosome seven. This locus, so a lot of the individuals in this study are taken from ascertainment from um, clinical populations. So it's really important to sort of tease out the suicide specific signal here from signal that might be due to just, hey, I've got uh, major depression and I'm looking at a locus for major depression instead of suicide risk. So there's conditioning done for psychiatric disorders and this top locus really is quite specific to suicide risk. It's also a locus um, previously associated in a UK biobank study with risk-taking behavior. So there's risk-taking again. Um, interestingly, and this isn't published data yet, we've started a new co collaboration with some individuals uh, at Duke who are um, investigators in the uh, Million Veteran Program. And they have some analyses from 14,000 suicide attempts and then close to 400,000 controls. And in their data, the top uh, International Suicide Genetics Consortium locus on chromosome seven, seven actually replicates, amazing. Like we never get replication in psychiatry. So everybody's quite happy about that. A meta-analysis, including both of these giant data sets gives us a very significant peak on chromosome seven, as you can see there. So what the heck, what is in chromosome seven? Well, we could, you know, we could look at our whole genome data and see whether or not any, anything in the whole genome data would actually tell us more about where should we look in this region? Cause it's an intergenic region and there's no obvious gene. There are some genes close by, but um, we don't really know where to look from that signal. So again, this region is significantly associated with risk-taking behavior in the UK Biobank. This is a huge uh, genome-wide study. Uh, so interesting, that signal just keeps coming up. Um, and the genes that are near this region, upstream, FOXP2. So that was why I highlighted that on the, um, the GWAS uh, results from our GWAS that, uh, that Anna Doherty has conducted. So that was one of the genes that was implicated by our GWAS. This gene is interesting. It's, uh, it's involved in GABA sig signaling. It's um, implicated in speech language disorder, in substance use disorder, in autism. And uh, quite recently, it's implicated in a, a genome-wide study of pain phenotypes in UK Biobank. So um, yeah, that, that may harken back to our associations with um, trauma, uh, trauma and um, sort of, um, accidental trauma exposure as a risk. Also upstream is, is MDFIC. So this is a transcriptional activator and it's associated with response to clozapine. So clozapine is an antipsychotic, so that's of interest. Downstream, there is um, another uh, transcription factor gene. This is associated with maturation of dendritic cells. So again, you know, these, these genes are interesting. Um, and it is worth asking, okay, do we expect that we would see an association with suicide death? So this, these big genome-wide association studies that we're sort of 
trying to follow up here with the consortia, they're really driven by suicide attempt. And we know from some of the, the work that we've been doing that individuals who die by suicide are pretty different from individuals who attempt. So should we expect to see this? Well, maybe. I mean, again, this is thinking about the fact that the FOXP2 was implicated in our Utah GWAS. Possibly this is a, a place where the two, the two phenotypic outcomes might overlap. Okay, so not to leave you in suspense for too long, did we see any high impact whole genome sequence variants in FOXP2? Yeah, yeah a few. Uh, there's a splice acceptor, there's a stop loss, there's a couple of non synonymous missense changes, but these are all really quite rare. And there's just no way they're gonna account for the GWAS signal. We'll have to wait for burden analyses. We'll have to also explore regulatory variants. And honestly, it might not be too surprising that this shouldn't be such a slam dunk, right? We're talking about following up a, a genome-wide association finding and genome-wide association findings are gonna be more common um, so it's, it's maybe not too surprising that we should think about something as being a little bit more subtle. So just to summarize a bit, uh, where are we? So yeah, burden analyses, integration of all of these other elements, looking at the SVs, uh, validation, oh my gosh, yeah, need to do that, and replication, which is going to be interesting, and we're going to meet that challenge head on. Uh, we're very excited to look at uh, sort of what the diagnosis, diagnoses of these folks might be, what their exposures might be. Also, we're really thinking about looking at their genetic backgrounds. Could we look at uh, polygenic risk scores and see if background polygenic risk is, is interacting in interesting ways with some of the whole genome variants? And we have a lot of good expertise in our group looking and thinking about polygenic risks. We're hoping that we get to uh, tug the sleeves of some of our colleagues in neurobiology anatomy and do some functional studies to look at biological mechanisms of some of our top hits. We're also, of course, engaged all the time in following up other studies, ongoing studies here in Utah, looking at certain risk subgroups. Um, the growing worldwide consortia really um, fantastic, high energy, and a lot of momentum in the worldwide uh, uh, research field. We're also starting a course because we don't have enough data, right? We're collecting new cohorts uh, to compare to. What we want to do um, in the next couple of years is look at uh, cohorts of non-suicide deaths with prior suicide attempt as sort of really trying to get at the differences um, in individuals who attempt versus in individuals who go on to die by suicide. We've got these um, collaborations with the medical examiner to try to get some samples from those individuals, also trying to work on a collaboration with Intermountain Diary Repository to, um, to look at that. Hoping that this will lead to real translation of results. So better early detection, intervention, development of really targeted treatments, figuring out subtypes, and trying to help keep people from dying. So this is a group of many, many people, and I just absolutely love all the people on this slide. This is folks across the university, people at Intermountain, international collaborators, people at the state, and uh, just such a pleasure to work with all these amazing people. And also, I just wanna thank all of the people that have supported this project, um, most recently Huntsman Mental Health in Institute, which actually funded the um, new sequencing data that I just talked about. And instead of hanging out on this slide, I'm just going to hang out on this slide, just in case anybody wants to copy down any of these resources. And I'm happy to take some questions. So Hillary, there were a couple of questions that um, were in the chat. Um, the first one was from David Grunwald um, early on in the talk. He was wondering in cases where two or more relatives or members of the same family attempt suicide, is there a correlation in the age of suicide? I think that's a good, that's really a good point. Um, 
Yeah, most of the time we have, so we have really paid much more attention to that when people are close relatives, because we're worried about, and, and instead of actually, okay, so that I think your question is getting at uh, a mechanism where it'd be like early death, does that run in families? And I'd have to say that I don't know the answer to that right now. Uh, we've more looked at that question from the fear that we are looking at non-genetic copycat um, instances where, you know, maybe people that are very close relatives have experienced the same trauma and it's less of a um, genetic effect. Um, and actually we've found that uh, oftentimes even when people are very closely related, the time span between when they have suicided is very great. So by a decade or more, which suggests that it's not some sort of environmental thing. So there was another question um, from Angela Snow. Do you have any thoughts on why suicide rates are increasing? That is a very good question. And, you know, I brought up that question at the beginning of the talk and never, never really got back to that. So, right, you know, it, the idea was, oh, we're getting way better at treating mental illness and suicide rates are either still going up or at least they're kind of hanging out really high and not going down. And I think one of the things that I wanted to sort of get at um, was that potentially suicide risk is kind of decoupled from risk of, or at least specific risk of psychopathology. And so even progress made in treating depression, anxiety might really not be quite getting at what we need to get at when we are thinking about um, really understanding suicide risk. So rates of suicide increasing is alarming. And it, it doesn't seem to me that that can be completely explained by some sort of genetic thing, right? So potentially people are being vulnerable exposed to more and more and more environmental stressors as our society becomes more complicated. Uh, potentially that's it. Um, I don't think people really have a good handle on that. If we had a good handle on it, we would be able to think better about uh, treatment strategies. And it's, a, it's gonna be a difficult um, and long road, but just because something's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Um, and then there's a question from Lisa, and I have, I have one as well that I'll follow with, but um, what do you think will be the impact on individuals and families learning they may carry these genetic risks? So that's a really good question for our ethics subgroup. Um, and we have really thought about that very hard. We're, you know, of course thinking, oh, we're doing this because we want to identify subtypes. We want to get at mechanisms. We're hoping that what we do really aligns with capacity for better treatment, capacity for prevention. What if it doesn't? Um, we have actually done a couple of focus groups with folks who have survived a suicide attempt or folks who are family members of individuals who have died by suicide to ask them these questions. Uh, we do definitely worry about our data getting out and then getting used in some direct consumer product that then, you know, you open up your phone and it says, how suicid suicidal are you? You know, put in your 23andMe data and compute your polygenic risk score, which would be absurd, right? Because it's not individually predictive. But just thinking about how that might get out there um, is quite alarming. And certainly... The people that we asked about these issues, they think that the idea that um, really, really uh, publishing the idea that this is a genetic, this has a significant genetic component is really positive. That it's not just some sort of character flaw or weakness, that there are biological um, underpinnings to this and that that is incredibly a positive thing for folks who are in this community that we're trying to serve. So the, the ideas of um, privacy, who's going to use this data, who gets this data, how do, how do we then think about 
gosh, what if the answer is you need to have really good access to services that aren't available to you? That's a problem. Then we need to be thinking about policy. So we, we definitely have a group that's really thoughtful that includes a lot of individuals where we're trying to grapple with some of these issues. So I'm gonna go back to my, my question and see if I can, if I can articulate it. But um, I was thinking about you know, treatments and, and you know, kind of that's the eventual, can you identify high-risk people and what sort of interventions or are there treatments? And I think about depression and how much progress has been made in treating depression. Um, and, but the, this, what, what you're seeing is, is it isn't necessarily a correlation with depression. There, there seems to be a contingent that's risk-taking behaviors. And are there treatments for risk people with risk-taking behavior? How is that thought about medically and biologically risk-taking behaviors? And then translate that maybe over to um, some of these biologic hits that you have um, through the genetics and, you know, anyhow. That, that's kind of my rambling thinking about. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting to kind of think about how this is going to play out. And of course, we're, we like to be really cautious and say, you know, everything has to get replicated. And, you know, yeah. But I, I think you could think about risk taking as an extension of uh, maybe some of the ADHD phenotypes, uh, impulsivity um, as being a, a basic sort of personality characteristic. Um, and, and I would have to say that, you know, risk-taking, right? This isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, probably having some sort of propensity for risk-taking along with maybe a biological propensity for poor reaction to stress along with an environmental exposure at this point, at this point, at this point that maybe even triggers some epigenetic mechanisms, right? So, I mean, all of this is, is quite... Uh, complex. And thinking about sort of more personalized treatments, I, I'm guessing we're a ways off from that. But even just understanding some of these implications where it's like, okay, just because somebody died by suicide doesn't mean they were automatically mean they were depressed. There may be other aspects to risk. And even that just very small piece of information could have consequences in care delivery. Well, thank you. A um, couple more questions just keep rolling in. Thank you. Thank you, David. So we've got following up on Angela's question. If you divide the population into, pro into prior to increase in suicide versus post increase, mm. uh, can you ask if there are differences in the degree of familial clustering? That's no, no difference. Would it be particularly interesting as it might support the importance of a genetic component? Yeah, that's a, that's a fascinating question. So that kind of gets at the idea of period cohort effects. And um, certainly we know about suicide death in the Utah population database. I mentioned this before, back to 1904. And that's just from the death certificate, right? It's a determination made by the Office of the Medical Examiner. One, one aspect of this that's tricky, um, and there is, a, there is a person who worked with Ken Smith, who was his PhD student, who actually looked at trends over time in suicide risk and thinking about familiality. So, you know, pulling out his thesis would be maybe very instructive to answer this question. Um, one aspect that's very hard is sort of the, the moving target of how suicide is defined and how society has accepted it. So the, the density of cases with suicide as you go back in time is less and less and less, right? So what is that? Is it truly less, uh, truly fewer people, lower incidence, or is it less reporting? Or is it a different definition? Um, for the most part right now, anyway, with the medical examiner, the suicide definition is very strict. Um, this has to do with implications for things like, you know, uh, insurance and certainly stigma. So uh, the medical examiner doesn't give that, that determination unless there's a lot of data to support it. That may have even been more the case uh, in prior years. And I think when, if we took only cases, like we lopped off all the cases at the bottom, 
of our genealogies, we would see far less familial clustering, but I'm not sure exactly how to interpret that. So it's a fascinating question and you know, Ken, Ken would love to probably dink around with uh, census data and death certificate data and period cohort effects and, and dig into this. I'm not sure that we, that, that we actually know yet. Wow, oh, thank you. Um, let's see, we've got, oh, it's, it's too late. We've got, time. Yeah, if, you, if you've got a moment, um, Cecile Avery had a question. Um, it's as a means of contextualizing this trait and its heritability, how does familial enrichment of suicide compare with other traits that have components of shared familial environment, like divorce, domestic violence, et cetera? So, I don't know. Um, I don't know the heritable component of other aspects like divorce. I do know that, as far as heritability is concerned, this is pretty comparable to other um, major psychiatric disorders. It's also fairly comparable to a lot of other just complex health traits. I mean, if you think about something like hypertension, I believe hypertension has a heritability of under 20%. And we all think of hypertension as being fairly genetic. So just to put it in context, um, I, I definitely agree that there are significant influences of environment. And I'm not trying to minimize those at all. Uh, they're hugely important. And certainly to say that heritability is 50% doesn't mean it's 50% in everyone. So one of the reasons to really try to get at that genetically enhanced group is that we actually do believe that for some individuals, their suicide risk is probably pretty environmental. Um, and we don't necessarily quite know how to tease that apart, except by some of these strategies that we have using the genealogy data. So I'm not sure if that really answered the question, but I definitely want to be sure that, that we, we are careful to say that we're not trying to minimize any environmental effects. Well, thank you very much, Hillary. This is this has been a fascinating talk. Incredible work. Um, thank you. Thanks.